Wow, thank you very much. Uh, you guys are so lucky to have this team working this event. I just asked a guy to get me a milkshake with two minutes notice, and he got it in one. <laughs> I want to give you a bit of a backstory to this talk um, and tell you a bit about my background. I uh, was never really great at school, which isn't really the kind of opening line you want for a university talk, but nevertheless, it's kind of true. I was okay up until the age of about 15, 16, but I was never really into reading and studying. I didn't really look down on people that did, but I just wasn't into it. But I was kind of interested in three particular topics, mathematics, art, and physical education. And those three subjects have remained with me really throughout my career, but in quite different ways. And although art was a big part of my life growing up, this guy here, Stellark, could have walked up to me and slapped me on the face with his third arm, and I wouldn't have known who he was. And it was remarkable to be here actually at Warwick two years ago and take this photograph of Stellark with another of the world's living cyborgs, Kevin Warwick, who was also here back then. And so when I think about the talk I want to give you today, it's about bringing these three things together and considering what role we have in the progress around science. And mathematics, art, and physical education are really the context for that. Now, some of the sci-fi fans amongst you will know that the title that I use borrows from Isaac Asimov's iRobot series. And it seems to me that there's some helpful guidance for today's scientists from some of his conclusions about what kinds of laws robots ought to follow. And it was a time, I think, that was really important and not too dissimilar to present times. Asimov wrote this book series, this short, short story collection, three years before uh, Watson and Crick came up with their DNA description. And I think what was crucial about that was the way in which it imagined um, the future of society, the role of genetics in our sense of what makes life. So a science fiction writer and a scientist occupying a similar territory in considering the future. Now think about those three laws that Asimov came up with. Robots should do no harm to humans, that they should obey humans in the conduct of their lives, and that they should protect themselves. Now, I know a few scientists, and they wouldn't necessarily be too keen on being analogized to robots, but nevertheless, I think in some ways these three laws apply to what scientists do today. They do no harm in the work that they conduct. The humans they obey, they're probably more funders than anything else, but nevertheless, there are laws that I think scientists do kind of adhere to. And they're also a very self-protecting community. For many years, science hasn't really been a very open place. It's grown significantly, but the kinds of people that do it have remained pretty much the same. And I think it's that that's beginning to change when I think about this concept I scientist. So what I think is beginning to happen in the world today is people are willing to embrace their role as scientists and technologists in the conduct of their everyday life. And this is beginning in a range of different ways. We can see this beginning to explode. This concept of the citizen scientist, I think, is indicative of that. And already, in your daily lives, you can go about a range of tasks that will be characterized as helping science. You can track the migration patterns of species. You can help map the brain. You can track ice sheets and their degradation. And I think already we have the technology that allows people to play an active part in this future. So what I want to say is to think about what this future might be if only that population of scientists was much bigger. Now, Whilst many of us can do this on our devices, on our computers, with very, li very little difficulty, I think there's also a population that are changing this uh, demographic in very significant ways. And very much like the DNA era, the Watson and Crick era, some of these initiatives are coming about in the wake of deep anxieties about what's going on in the world. In 2004, I first encountered the bioart movement essentially a range of people that were trying to use some of these new techniques from biotechnology in the creation of new art experiences, either performance or visual. 
And there was a guy called Steve Kurtz in the USA who was setting up his own lab in his house. And he was subject to an FBI investigation for bioterror. And a lot of people in the, world, in the art world felt this was a real affront to artistic freedom. And since then, any number of artists have come forward and begun to make work with biotechnology. This is John O'Shea, who's creating, wait for it, pig's bladder footballs. And his critique is partly about the use of synthetic substances within our world and wants to explore how we might recreate the natural products by using biotechnological devices. And it's not bad. I mean, I had to go with it. The football is sort of reasonably OK. We had a kind of competition. I only really managed three. It's not very spher spherical at this point, but the principle's there. And John's worked with a, a scientist to put this together. So people like John are working within laboratories with scientists now and beginning to bring science to a much broader population, ask a different series of questions about it. Jan Marusic is a performance artist, and in this particular performance, he secretes a blue dye through his pores, and you begin to see the, the physiological processes that underpin our everyday lives. And it takes him about 40 minutes to go through this, and very powerfully expresses what's happening within our bodies. I think the range of things that are brought into question by these interventions are extraordinary. Revital Cohen, a designer who developed her Assistance Animals project, concerned about the isolationism that we have developed over the last century, where we ghettoize species from one to the next. In this Assistance Animals project, she wonders how another species could help people to live and avoid them being connected to just inanimate, cold, metallic objects. And many of these initiatives are very provocative. They challenge people's perspectives on what they think we ought to be doing. But I think what unites them, and what inspires me at least, is that when artists and designers set about their work, they begin with a curiosity that I think is present within the most experimental research and science that's out there. And that all you really require is a curiosity to figure out how something might work and set about explaining that or demonstrating it. That's not to say that there aren't going to be challenges. And in fact, the citizen science movement, and there's a series of active projects that you can take part in already, have raised questions about how do we regulate this? Isn't this the sort of thing that you shouldn't be allowed to do unless you're qualified? Isn't it something that we should train people to do and get some kind of evidence that they know what they're doing, that they adhere to some kind of ethical or regulatory principles? And that's all relevant. But I think the idea is that this is inaccessible or that we can't expand this community significantly is wrong. And in fact, they said the same sort of thing about journalism about 10 years ago, just before the Web 2.0 boom was about to occur. And lo and behold, people now are quite willing to embrace their role as citizen journalists and tweet content, put it online, express themselves through video. And it's become part and parcel of that professional sphere. Some might argue for the worst, but it's happening. And it's, it's something that I think people feel strongly is a good thing. So why does all this matter? Why do we need to think about these questions? Well, it seems to me that the third part that's relevant is how we consider the future. Now, I don't think it's a question of predicting the future. Um, these, matters, these, these matters aren't important because we need to think about predicting the future. They matter because it's important that we locate ourselves in that future, that we think about what kinds of knowledge systems are relevant in the future, how things like science will look, what kinds of people will be doing it, what kinds of questions they might ask, and how that results from the kind of training they have. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine about a year ago who works at the National Science Foundation in America. And he had just come out of a meeting. And uh, he, he actually emailed me and said, wow, I've just learned, he's, in, he's a sociologist, so one of those rare people that's in the sociology program of, of these scientific bodies. And they were debating the cost of a new telescope for the nation. And he calculated that if they bought this telescope, or instead of buying the telescope, 
they could actually fund a sociological research program for 600 years. Now, there's a real judgment about what really matters. Now, I guess we kind of want to know what's up there in case it comes down here, but I kind of also want to know why we have crime in society, why people feel certain senses of injustice, and so we have to consider how we, how we set this balance. And it seems to me that the more people that you put within that position of decision-making, the more people you have engaged with science, the easier it will be to make that argument. Now, I don't think that we are in any more vulnerable state with regard to our future today than we were 100 years ago. We face uncertainties on a daily basis. Um, so we shouldn't get too carried away with this idea that the future is any more uncertain or unpredictable or worrisome than it was way back when. But I think what strikes me about the citizen science movement is that it relocates creativity and artistic and design expression at the heart of it. And I would argue that, in fact, this has always been at the heart of scientific development, that when you disciplines within science begin, they rely on a similar kind of creativity as, um, as artistic practice. Now, 137 years ago to the day was the last day of a world without telephones. And I think this is helpful in reminding us what we still have to kind of figure out. This is a screenshot from Alexander Graham Bell's notes on that day, where he writes what he said as the first words um, uttered through telephonic device, uh, the harmonic telegraph, as he called it. Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. Those were the first, word uttered, first words uttered. Now, I think what's interesting about this is that it kind of reminds us that our desire for remoteness, the pervasiveness of digital media, translates and relates very intimately to our desire for proximity and closeness. And it's no surprise to me, at least, that the next thing that was said by Mr. Watson uh, in response to that was, do you understand what I say? I added the lol bit in this, just in case you were wondering, but, but it seems to me that we're still in that situation of figuring out what the hell people are saying. Uh, despite all the media that we have available to us. And this is going to be crucial, I think, when we think about these questions, when we try to make sense of the world, when we try to make sense of, of the natural world. And I think we've got a kind of example as, as to how that kind of creative expression is, is sort of weeded out of us as we, as we grow up. This is my son, Ethan. And uh, as a kind of epilogue to the talk, I want to kind of show you what happens when a young person discovers something for the first time. So we'll, we'll skip through these, and, and I think what's um, the most important thing to bear in mind is that a lot of things are at stake here. We will have to rethink a number of things in this era of citizen science. Not least is the kind of education systems that we have, and how we put people like my two-year-old son through education. And about uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, um, Ethan was in, his, in our kitchen, and uh, started dancing to a, to a Prince track, would you believe? And you can see Ethan kind of discovering dance here. Now, oh, he falls down for a second, and then kind of realizes, that's quite good. Let's do a bit more of that. And within a kind of a space of two minutes, he's pretty much discovered break dancing. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm not sure where he's going to take this, but I think what's, what's, uh, what we can learn from it is that Whilst we kind of celebrate this kind of creative expression very early on in life, we need to figure out a way of matching it with scientific uh, development. And uh, you can also follow him on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> um, so Ethan's taught me a lot about how someone at that age can work on an iPad, discover breakdancing all at the same time. And, um, and I hope that when he goes for education, science and art might be a bit closer together. Thanks very much.